Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us here on KXAN Live. I'm Will Dupree. We're going to share now a live stream of the comments that Austin Public Health are doing. This is their bi-weekly uh, COVID-19 update. What we should say is that there are some new rules that have come out just this morning, and they will be talking about those more in depth here. But now masks are optional, not required in Austin and Travis County. This is after Governor Greg Abbott's order earlier this week about those rules. Let's take a listen as this gets underway. My name is Adrienne Stirp, and I have the pleasure of serving as the interim director for Austin Public Health. Um, this week has been uh, a week of milestones. We, we are in a good place as a community with respect to managing COVID, but acknowledging that we still have more work to do. And in the coming weeks, you will see us um, change our strategy to have more of an equity focus. We will continue to work with our communities to reach out to those zip codes and areas where we're still seeing some disparities, but still remaining confident that we are on the right track to get towards herd immunity. Dr. Escott. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I want to start by first saying uh, that earlier today I signed a notice transitioning the health authority rules issued on Tuesday into recommendations. Uh, as we're aware, the governor about two hours following uh, the issuance of those orders uh, issued an executive order himself, which created conflict between the two. Uh, now's not the time for us to be in conflict. Now's the time for us to focus on the message. And the message is that unvaccinated people or partially vaccinated people need to wear a mask when they're out in public. Those who are unvaccinated need to get vaccinated. This is the best protection that we have right now. The data that we have for vaccinated people in Travis County indicate to us that 99.9% .9 of them have not yet uh, uh, developed COVID-19 infection. That's incredibly good. This is much better than the best flu shot we've ever had. So right now we wanna focus on that message that folks need to get vaccinated if they're unvaccinated. Uh, and if they are vaccinated, it is now time for them to be able to relax a little bit uh, there's still certain circumstances where folks should still mask uh, as outlined in, in those guidelines. And we look forward to our community continuing to embrace the, the keys to success which have worked so far. So far, Travis County has less than half of the death rate from COVID-19 as any other uh, jurisdiction in the state of Texas in terms of major metropolitan areas. Less than half the rate of Texas as a whole less than half the rate of the United States as a whole. Um, you know, our, our transmission is lower than any other metropolitan area of Texas as well. Uh, this is because our community has worked together. They've continued to mask when others didn't. They've continued to distance when others didn't. They continue to stay home when they're sick and get tested. These are the things that have worked and will continue to work as we drive COVID-19 uh, to zero. So with that, I will turn it over to Janet Pichette. Good morning. Uh, I'll just add that, yes, as both Adrian and Dr. Escott have mentioned, we are in a really good place now in Austin and Travis County and in Texas as a whole. And I do feel like we are on the road to recovery. Uh, and with that, I think what will happen is our focus will then begin to transition so that we look at var variants that are circulating in our community. We're going to be focusing on reinfections and breakthrough disease uh, following vaccination so that we can try to really understand, uh, you know, what's the best way to protect ourselves uh, from here on out. Um, you know, uh, the focus on clusters and the case, now that the cases are low, our increase in case investigation and contact tracing will increase with the goal of trying to stamp out this disease. We're going to try to figure out where those clusters are, where those hot spots might be, and try to tamp those down um, so that we don't have a reignition of a, of a surge. So, um, you know, um, 
you know, I think uh, with uh, variants that are circulating, we've recently heard that Dallas had the Indian variant, Indi the variants from India identified, and those were identified in uh, people with no travel history means that we have that variant in the state and it's circulating. It could very well be in our community, but we need to make sure that we continue to protect ourselves from those types of strain. One of the best ways to protect ourselves right now is to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Vaccines save lives. Uh, and we've seen that happen uh, with, with how effective they've been in uh, reducing the number of cases. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Um, uh, Cassie DeLeon. Thank you, Janet. Um, and uh, want to just um, really commend the community on uh, being willing to get out there and get the vaccine, get out there and make sure that as you're, um, as we're reopening, that you're continuing to be careful. Um, and that, that um, speaking back to what Dr. Escott said, that really translates to how well we have fared throughout this entire pandemic and how we'll be able to fare uh, moving through the, the, the next few months and, and ongoing years. Um, with the new Pfizer expanded um, population um, that's eligible for that vaccine and is appropriate for the Pfizer vaccine, we have um, seen some good uptake, almost 9,000 uh, children between the ages of 12 to 15 um, have at least gotten one dose of Pfizer. And so that, that really is very encouraging, noting that that's only been available for about a week. Um, so we really want to encourage um, parents and families and anyone who hasn't gotten vaccinated to go ahead and get the vaccine. It's available in many, many locations. Um, if you get your vaccine from Austin Public Health, you can walk up to any of our locations. We encourage you to call 301 just to find out what the hours are and where we're operating. But you can go to any location, request your vaccine, um, it's free. You don't have to show any ID. You don't have to um, prove insurance. It should be as easy as anything else uh, to get your vaccine. Um, also, just to kind of piggyback on what um, Director Stirrup said, we are really looking to right size the vaccine intervention. Um, we know that really taking the vaccine where people are, where people live, where people can access um, is really the key right now to make sure that there's absolutely no barrier and um, people have a lot of resources available to them. So we'll be looking in the next few weeks and working with our partners to really make sure that wherever the vaccine can, can be um, of help and needs to be um, provided, that we're there and we're providing that to, to the greater community. Um, with that, I'll open, a, uh, open us up for questions. Thank you, Cassandra. At this time, we will now go to our pool reporter, Sangeeta Menon from KUT. Sangeeta? The first question is from KUT. How is the new community-based approach for vaccine distribution going? How many events have been held and how many people have been vaccinated at those events? I'll jump in. Um, they've actually been going really well. We are connected um, from Austin Public Health's perspective. We've provided quite a few events. Um, starting in March was really when we started um, partnering with faith-based organizations and many other groups to really connect uh, to provide vaccine. And there's uh, many plans. We usually have about two to three per week that we pop up, but we also have had a mobile vaccine um, team that's been working since um, February to go to many, many different locations. And they are usually hitting three different locations per day um, throughout the week. So there's there's quite a few that we've done. Um, and we definitely are seeing that this is the time to really mobilize and, and really um, expedite those different types of um, operations to any place we can across the community. The next Thanks, question sir. is from me. No, go ahead, Adrian. All right, I just want to jump in real quick and add on to what um, Cassie shared. Um, I believe our mobile outreach team has provided five over 5,000 vaccinations thus far. And um, this week, we will be at the Sacred Heart Church on Friday and Saturday. We will be at Dell Valley High School on Saturday, and that is in partnership with Travis County. And then on Sunday, weather permitting, we will have be, we'll be having an LGBTQ plus event um, in collaboration with many partners that service that community at Gibbons Park. 
And so we are really, um, you know, digging our teeth and our heels into, into this community-based approach to make sure that we leave no stone unturned and that everyone who wants a vaccine has that equitable access. Thank you. The next question is from the Austin American Statesman. Can businesses legally require proof of vaccination for customers? What laws allow or prevent them from doing so? I'm happy to address that one. Uh, first, let me say I'm not a lawyer, so it's important to consult uh, your, your attorneys on, on this uh, question in particular. However, when we look at, at the privacy of medical information, that privacy is the information the person has, okay? Uh, so if an individual chooses to share their vaccination status with someone else, a business owner, as a condition of entry, uh, there's not a privacy issue because the owner of that information is sharing it. Uh, certainly, the information that we've seen so far indicate that a business uh, can ask for proof of vaccination for entry into a, a private space, which is which is their business. Um, so, you know, it, it is unlikely that we're going to see that to a large extent. But there are some places, as I discussed on Tuesday, uh, that may be more inclined uh, to want certainty about entry uh, without masking. For instance, uh, hair salons where an, an individual may be uh, in the hair salon for several hours uh, at a time face-to-face uh, -face without mask on. This is a high-risk circumstance. Uh, in that kind of circumstance, an uh, individual may want uh, more proof than, than someone's word. Uh, but again, uh, it, it's important for, for those businesses to consult uh, for, for legal advice uh, when they're developing their policies. I also want to mention that the, the, the governor has been very clear throughout this pandemic, and that is businesses have the right to determine the conditions of entry. So if a business says, has a mask required sign, masks are required as a condition of entry. Uh, if somebody enters without a mask on, they're trespassing um, and can be asked to leave. Uh, this is this is the right of a business owner, uh, and certainly uh, we expect here locally that that people will respect that, and that many businesses will choose to continue uh, masking in the you know in the short term. The next question is from KXAN. Last update, Dr. Escott said, if you had COVID, you still need to get vaccinated. Some people question that. Can you expand on why it's important? The evidence that we have right now is that the protection from the COVID vaccine is uh, more comprehensive than having the disease itself. When we look at the reinfection rate versus the breakthrough infection rate, so you've been fully vaccinated and get infected, the uh, reinfection rate for COVID-19 is about 20 times higher than it is for breakthrough infections. Uh, again, right now, the data that we have in hand is that 99.9% .9 of people who've been vaccinated have not been infected with COVID after they were fully vaccinated. Um, it's incredibly powerful vaccine. It's an incredibly safe vaccine. Uh, so we encourage all members of our community, even the ones who've had COVID to get the shot. Uh, I think as we go through the summer and we see EUAs lifted and full approval granted for many of these vaccines, we're also likely to see institutions starting to require them. Uh, so schools, universities, uh, and, and some businesses as well. The next question is from CBS Austin. Do you think the change in masking policy will have a significant impact on Austin's ability to reach herd immunity? The previous relaxation of masking rules by Governor Abbott did not seem to negatively impact reducing cases. Well, my concern is that, you know, I agree the the, uh, the cases have continued to drop. However, uh, you'll notice that we've had dropping and then plateau and then dropping and then plateau. 
our concern is that uh, that we're we're going to see a prolonged tail on, on this uh, on this pandemic here in Texas. Uh, when we look at the data uh, of Travis County active cases per 100 population versus the rest of the state, the number of cases per 100 residents is four to five times higher outside of Travis County uh, as compared to inside Travis County. The same is true when we look at Travis County versus the other counties in the MSA. 4.5 times higher active cases as compared to Travis County. To me, that's evidence that uh, that, that masking policy works. Uh, and that's why we continue to encourage our businesses, our community members, particularly those who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated, to continue masking until we can reach a better place of herd immunity. The next question is from Community Impact. In the past, local authorities have pushed back on Governor Abbott's orders banning mask mandates from local officials. Why not now? So, you know, again, when we engage in battle between the city and the state, the message becomes about the battle and not about the message. And the message that we want people to hear is that if you're vaccinated completely, then you're relatively safe. Again, 99.9% of folks who've been vaccinated have not gone on to develop COVID-19 so far. However, those who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated need to continue to protect themselves uh, when they're out in public. This is the message that the CDC shared a week ago. And somehow we transition from uh, that message into this perception that, that masking is optional for, for the entire country. That's not at all what the CDC said. What they said is for vaccinated people, you can move around relatively freely, except for certain circumstances where vulnerability is much higher. Unvaccinated people, partially vaccinated people, should still wear masks. That piece of the message has been lost in the past week, and we want to bring that message back to the forefront. Uh, I also want to say we're grateful for the state. We're grateful for the governor and what they've done to support Austin and Travis County throughout the past year. The governor's issuing of a mask mandate back in June when it was a very, very unpopular thing to do for a Republican governor, but he did it anyway because he knew that he needed to protect Texans. And the result has been thousands of lives saved because of that decision. We've had support from, from the Texas Division of Emergency Management, from DSHS, in, uh, in our regional infusion center, in our uh, Austin Convention Center, which was our alternate care site, and a number of other initiatives. The state has come in to support this community, including healthcare personnel for all of our area hospitals. Uh, so I don't want to vilify the state. Uh, we have worked together with the state throughout this pandemic Yes, there is a disagreement on what that policy should be, but we want the message heard. And I think by avoiding a prolonged legal battle, we can focus our efforts on the battle in front of us, which is ensuring that folks are vaccinated and ensuring that the message is heard. And I'll add what I said earlier in my opening remarks, and that is what we have seen is that vaccines save lives and, you know, I think, as Dr. Escott mentioned, I think the goal here for all of us is to get as many people vaccinated as possible, try to break down the barriers and break down uh, the reason why people are hesitant to receive that vaccine. Um, I think we all want to get back to normal. And I think one of the key ways to do it is uh, to get vaccinated um, and if you're not vaccinated or if you feel unsure about going out in public, you can always still wear your mask. That's, you know, a le level of protection. Um, and, you know, I think people need to be respectful and mindful that there are reasons why people choose to do uh, their masking uh, in public places. Uh, it, it could be to, be, be to protect a loved one. But uh, again, vaccinations are, have been key in our response.
The next question is from KOOP Radio. How concerned are you about the two cases of the India variant in North Texas? In the past, you have stated that if a variant is in the U.S. or the state, it is also here. Um, I am concerned about that. Uh, obviously, um, viruses don't like to stay the same. They like to mutate. They like to change their configuration to try to outsmart the host. And so I, I think the variant from India being on, on our uh, horizon in, in, our, in our state is uh, concerning, and we will be watching it very closely. Of concern, based on the information I've received, is that these uh, cases are not in people who have a travel history anywhere. So to me, that means that it's out in the community, uh, you know, and so once you have it in the community, we can begin to um, see it spread within the community if people aren't careful. So, you know, that's one reason why we are trying to focus, uh, refocus our ep epidemiologic response efforts on looking at variant surveillance and trying to get uh, some of these uh, samples uh, sequenced to identify what variants are circulating in our community. It's kind of the the thing we do, uh, whether it be flu or coronavirus now, um, you know, the better and more quickly we can identify something, the, the faster we can squash that disease and keep it at bay um, and, and prevent clusters and outbreaks from occurring. Um, so, so we are concerned. Let me also just add, I, I think the situation in India is a reminder to us as a community, as a country, that our duty doesn't stop with vaccinating the United States. We have to work hard to vaccinate the rest of, of the planet. Uh, we're going to see new variants emerge in places like India, places like Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Laos, Nigeria. Uh, these densely populated places are, are where we're going to see variants emerge. And as the variants uh, continue to become more competitive, we risk the development of a variant that uh, eludes uh, the, the current vaccine. Uh, so again, we need to work quickly uh, to get our community vaccinated so that we can pivot uh, to those, those areas of, of the planet that, that are struggling with their vaccination effort. The next question is from the Austin American Statesman. Has Austin Public Health had any coronavirus vaccines go to waste in recent weeks because of a decrease in demand? If so, how many? I'll jump in and uh, respond. So I think it's really important to think about the um, COVID vaccine clinics and the process. And then also um, there's waste that's involved with COVID vaccine clinics. And then there's also um, areas that we have to track to make sure we don't have vaccine loss. Um, and it's two different um, considerations. Vaccine loss is when we have vaccine that's been stored in a um, storage facility, a refrigeration or freezer, and for some reason um, that vaccine becomes unviable, meaning that it either um, was out of temperature for a certain period of time or it expired. Um, Austin Public Health has had no incidences of that occurring. So I think that's really important that we've really been tracking our vaccine inventory to make sure it's appropriate for the um, population that we're serving in for the um, gauging to see if the population demand dwindles that we're able to utilize all of the vaccine that we have and uh, not risk any expiration. We've also been able to help other cities to um, uh, transfer vaccine from them to us to, because they had some risk of vaccine potentially expire. And we've been able to integrate them into those vaccines into our operations so that there's no loss and we can support the larger statewide effort. Vaccine waste at a clinical effort does happen uh, from time to time. And particularly when we have mass large clinics, um, vaccine uh, waste will occur from mechanical failure, from syringes, from uh, potential um, um, contamination that might happen to the needle. Uh, and those things happen, can happen daily at a clinic and, and um, typically is something that uh, we do anticipate. While it is few, usually it's under you know five or so per clinic. It is something that we, we do take very seriously. On the other piece where we draw vaccine and we don't have enough um, 
individuals to come to the clinic. We work with our other clinics across the city to try to push that vaccine to another location so that we can find arms to put the vaccine in to minimize as much uh, waste as possible if there's just not someone to provide the vaccine to. That being said, we really are encouraged that the Department of State Health Services has um, eased some on um, if you have an arm and you haven't um, opened up a new vial, go ahead and do that because vaccinating that one person, providing them with that protection is much more precious and much more important in protecting that individual and the community than um, potentially wasting additional vaccine because we didn't have additional arms to provide to. So we really work towards that. Um, we work very hard not to waste any vaccine, but as we see less and less um, demand for vaccine, um, our first priority is going to be to make sure we vaccinate anyone who is willing and ready to get that vaccine and not let the fact that some vaccine may go to waste be a, a barrier to them getting the vaccine. The next question is from KXAN. What's your biggest challenge right now as Austin Public Health? I'll be happy to, to start that. You know, I think the, the biggest challenge at this stage is, is the threat of a, a long tail towards herd immunity. Uh, it's getting that last uh, percentage of our population vaccinated. Uh, we've, we've done a great job. Uh, we're significantly higher in terms of vaccination rates in the state of Texas. Uh, and we're happy that, that our community has been engaged in, in getting vaccinated. But we've got more work to do uh, as the school year ends, as summer begins, as people uh, get the sense that things are better because they are. We also risk the fact that um, they may be less inclined to get the vaccine. It's important that we continue those efforts. We continue sharing the, uh, the efficacy and the safety information related to vaccines so that, that we can truly get to herd immunity uh, and drive those case numbers down to zero. And I'll add that, you know, I think we're at a point now where we are trying to right size our operations to make sure that um, as we devolve some services, um, whether it be testing or vaccine operations transition to a more community and mobile approach, uh, there is still a lot of, it, from the outside, it may look like our work is over, but it really in reality is not. We are continuing to work. You have a, a strong public health workforce that continues to do case investigations and track down outbreaks and clusters and ensure that our community is safe uh, if we if we identify people, making sure they get into quarantine or isolation, so that we can uh, you know we can get this behind us. Um, you know we're working very hard on uh, evaluating and assisting those who are beginning to reintegrate back into the workforce and making sure uh, they understand the best way to uh, protect their workforce as well. But there's a lot of work that will continue, as Dr. Escott says, as this tail continues to trail out. Uh, you know, we, we still are doing a lot of work that um, may go unnoticed. Thanks, Janet. And I, I'll just jump in and there and kind of piggyback off of what you and Dr. Escott just shared. Um, when I think about our, our, our next biggest challenge, it really is um, systemic distrust in, in healthcare in our historically marginalized populations. And unfortunately, that's where we are seeing um, the greatest disparities with respect to uh, vaccine uptake. And so, you know, every day we are working with our community partners and internally with leadership to, as Cassie said, right size our operations so that we are meeting those needs. Um, there's a, a sense of sensitivity um, with which we have to approach that because um, that hesitancy comes from historic mistrust and, 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 and misuse in those communities and how we approach that and how we work together with them to, to get over this last hump will be important. Thank you. The 
The last question is from KOOP Radio. With the real potential that many unvaccinated will likely remain so, will it be possible to reach herd immunity over a much longer time as they are exposed and therefore being vaccinated through exposure to the virus? Again, I think there's danger in in that approach uh, because we know that the reinfection rates uh, are much higher than the, the breakthrough infection rates. Um, and, you know, again, the, the concern that we have regarding over relaxation of policy right now is that you allow COVID-19 to fester for longer. Now's the opportunity to chop the head off the snake. It's ta- now the time, the opportunity to kill it. And if we maintain the vigilance a little bit longer, if we continue a hard push on vaccinations, if we continue to support masking by unvaccinated people, by people in public transit uh, uh, methods, in large gatherings, then we can cut the head off the snake. Otherwise, this may fester for a very long time. I think we're all best served by ending COVID-19 now. Uh, So our hope is that our community will come together Uh, continue to encourage one another to get vaccinated and to continue to support masking for unvaccinated folks. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Thank you, Sangeeta. We will now move into our closing remarks. We will start with Director Adrian Stirrup first. Adrian. Thank you. Um, As I listened to the, the conversation that we had today, I'm struck by what that really, if you boil down all of the data and the the measures of success, it really speaks to the strength of our community. This is not something that was done to us or for us. This is something that we decided and we still have the power of that decision. So you can decide to wear your mask if that's where you're, you're comfortable. You can decide to get vaccinated and you can decide to support others in that effort. So as long as we keep making good decisions, I am confident that we will get to where we need to be. I I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that part of um, the ability for our community to come together is having access to good information and sound advice. And so I'd like to thank Dr. Escott for his service over these long months. Um, You have been the voice of reason in, in many conversations for us internally as a city, and I know for our community. And so I just thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And, uh, you know, this this is my last uh, press briefing. So I, I, again, appreciate the the partnership uh, with all of you, but but with our media as well. Uh, I appreciate the the approach that you all have taken. and uh, I think it certainly has been uh, part of, of our success uh, has been that interaction with the media. Uh, so my many thanks for that. Uh, you know, pe- people ask about, about masking and distancing and, you know, is it too burdensome and does it work? Uh, it has worked. Uh, our, our, our case fatality rate is amongst the lowest of any city in the United States. People ask, well, what about the economic impact? Our unemployment rate is among the lowest in the United States. What that tells me is that we found the right balance. And if we continue that balance, if we continue the push for vaccinations, if we continue to mask in public places for people who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated a little bit longer, we're talking about another two to four weeks, we can kill the snake we can end the COVID-19 pandemic, and we can all get back to normal. Yes, there's gonna be some ongoing risk for young school-aged children, but for adults, uh, individuals 12 and older, uh, we're, we're talking about a, a very quick uh, progression to, to zero cases. Uh, so I hope that our community will continue to stay in the fight. Uh, I hope that we will continue to be a model for other cities in the United States. And I hope that once we get past COVID here, that that sense of, of community will transition to supporting the effort across the globe 
uh, which is much, much needed for us to really uh, conquer COVID-19. With that, I will turn it over to Janet Pichette. Thanks, and I too would like to thank Dr. Escott. He's been a rock for us here at Austin Public Health, and uh, we have valued his uh, experience and his decision making. And uh, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, a lot of uh, hurdles that we had to overcome over the last year and a half. So I, I've appreciated that he has been here for us and been that support for us. And with that, you know, we are on our road to recovery and, you know, we will continue to maintain our public health epidemiologic operations to make sure that we are uh, getting the best information we can about the, what's circulating in our community so that we can, again, temp out uh, COVID for good and, uh, um, you know, again, you know, vaccines are saving lives. It's important that if you have any reservations that you educate yourself and try to get vaccinated, uh, if not for yourself, for someone who may be in your family who, or somebody who's immunocompromised that you may encounter, um, you know, we all want to get back to normal. And I think that's one of the, the best ways to do it. Uh, and if, as, as Adrian mentioned earlier, if you want to wear a mask, wear your mask. I plan on wearing my mask still when I go out because I have a loved one at home who I'm trying to protect and continue to protect. So, um, you know, again, I, I encourage people, strongly encourage them to get vaccinated so that we can uh, get back to Austin being as weird as possible, I guess. <laughs> And I just have to echo um, both Director Stirrup and um, Janet's um, really words uh, of thanks to Dr. Escott. Um, he's been a cornerstone in this entire response and been so uh, important in just leading our local effort. And um, it uh, was a, a ask that came at a time where we we didn't have a health director, a medical a director, health authority, and he was willing to step up and took it and has been an incredible leader and just to thank him for his um, incredible leadership during this time. And as we look into this next weekend and as we look to uh, the summer, I just, again, echoing everyone else saying, please get your vaccine, please do your research, um, know that vaccine is readily available in lots of different outlets. Um, you can um, get it on the weekend, you can get it in the evening, you can get it in the morning. There's just so many places you can get your vaccine. So please, Check it out. See your church may be offering it. Your school may be offering it. Just your business, the place of work. There's vaccine in lots of different places. So please check to see where you can get your vaccine. It's free. Um, you don't have to provide insurance. Um, you don't have to show any ID. You just need to go get that vaccine. And I wish you a happy, great weekend. And um, let's all just keep taking care of each other. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Cassandra. That concludes our media availability for today. Thanks to interim APH director, Adrian Stirrup, Dr. Mark Escott, chief epidemiologist, Janet Pichette, Cassandra DeLeon, APH chief administrative officer for disease prevention and health promotion division, and to our pool reporter, Sangeeta Menon from KUT. Thanks for joining us and have a safe weekend. Hey there, everybody, and thanks for sticking with us as we brought you this live virtual briefing from Austin Public Health. Again, if you happen to miss it, this is the last one for Dr. Mark Escott. He has been the interim health authority for Austin Travis County. He is now moving into the city of Austin's chief medical officer role, so he will no longer be a part of these briefings about the COVID-19 response and the ongoing vaccination process here in our area. Uh, Dr. Desmar Walks, she is going to take that position next. She serves in that current role in Bastrop County and will now be doing that for Austin Travis County. So we look forward to hearing from her in the coming briefings that we will be sharing with you all uh, here about COVID-19 since it is still getting people sick, still people are dying from it, and the vaccination process 
is still ongoing. Uh, vaccination is available for COVID-19, not just through Austin Public Health, but through many providers. Uh, we should note that the Pfizer vaccine has gotten emergency use authorization for people 12 and older. So from 12 to 15, that was the latest addition. And now those 12 and older can get the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. We should note that Cassie DeLeon, uh, one of the assistant directors at Austin Public Health, said that almost 9,000 children within that age group have now gotten that vaccine. And that's just within less than a week. Uh, that is progress being made there. And they're encouraging people to get their shots and consider having their children get those shots too once they do the research and feel that it's comfortable and safe to do so. Uh, but again, they are urging people to get the vaccine. Uh, interesting note uh, that Dr. Mark Escott shared is that he said 99.9% .9 of people who are fully vaccinated, meaning they've either gotten the two shots and then have spent two weeks after getting the Pfizer or Moderna options or two weeks after getting that one shot Johnson & Johnson option, he said that 99.9% .9 of them have not gotten infected by COVID-19. He says that he is hoping that will encourage more people to get the vaccinations if they've not done so already. Uh, we are following this as well as this new rule that has come down from Austin Travis County that uh, masking is now optional. However, for those who are unvaccinated or just partially vaccinated, health experts are still urging people to put the mask on. They are recommending that usage and they are saying that all of us should still be a little bit cautious. Uh, there are these new rules. We've broken them down on our website. That's kxan.com. Uh, this change has happened after the governor, Governor Greg Abbott, issued an executive order that prevented uh, government agencies and school districts and health authorities throughout the state from enforcing or requiring face coverings or masks. So they were just following in line with uh, what the governor had issued earlier this week. And again, you can find more details over on our website. Thanks again for watching, everybody. I'm Will Dupree in the KXAN Live Studio. We appreciate it. We'll see you back here throughout the day with additional updates. We'll see you later. Everybody stay safe and healthy out there and take care.